Welcome to the Swarm Intelligence course. Today we're going to look into the automatic design of collective behaviors for robot swarms. We start here with an example that illustrates our vision. A lady named Fiorella owns and operates a small robot swarm gardening business. She has a group of robots and she has a number of customers. The customers can book the service of Fiorella online using her website. They do so by uh, specifying the characteristics uh, of uh, their garden, the size of the garden, the shape of the garden, the kind of trees that uh, are uh, in the garden, and by specifying the kind of uh, service that uh, they require. To provide the best service possible, but also to cut the costs and to maximize her own benefits. Fiorella uses automatic design to customize the control software of her robots to the specific needs of each customer. Fiorella is very successful. She has a lot of customers, so her agenda is always extremely busy. So uh, she has a little time for uh, designing the behavior of the robots for each customer. And so uh, the design process takes a place while Fiorella drives the robots to the customers. So you see that Fiorella in the cartoon is driving her van to the customer and in the meantime the design process is running on her computers to define the behavior of the robots for the specific intervention that the customer where she is driving has requested and for the specific garden of this customer. So as we said above, Fiorella has a, a time constraints, she wants to cut the costs, uh, therefore uh, she does not have a time to intervene in the design process. She does not have the time to test uh, the behavior that has been produced by the design process. And so this design process needs really to be very reliable. It needs to be so reliable that she can unload the robots from the van, switch them on, and they need to be operational. Here you have the outline of the lecture of today. We will start by presenting some introductory concepts. Then I will give uh, some uh, definition. I will present the main working hypothesis and the idea behind uh, the development of the automatic design methods that I will uh, present uh, during the lecture. Uh, I will um, speak about uh, the relationship between uh, the classical uh, uh, evolutionary robotics approach and automode, which is uh, the uh, original approach that uh, I would present in the lecture. Uh, then uh, I will uh, present uh, automode vanilla and automode chocolate, which are two implementations of uh, uh, automode. And then I will uh, present uh, uh, the Demiurge project, which is uh, the project uh, on which I'm working at the moment uh, together with my group. I know you have already seen uh, Swarm Robotics with uh, Professor Dorigo, 
and we have also discussed uh, a number of concepts together in my previous lecture on division of labor. So here I will only limit myself uh, to summarize uh, a couple of points uh, that are uh, important to keep in mind uh, uh, while uh, discussing uh, the contents of uh, this uh, uh, lecture. Well, the following are the main characteristics of a robot swarm. A robot swarm operates autonomously and it is uh, self-organized in the sense that there is uh, no leader robot and no external infrastructure that uh, directs or helps uh, the robot in uh, making the decisions. A swarm is uh, highly redundant, so it might be either homogeneous or heterogeneous, but in any case, none of the individual robot is indispensable. The robots are only capable of local perception and communications, and therefore each individual robot can interact only with the few peers that happen to be in its neighborhood and it is unaffected by the overall size of the swarm. The robots operate in parallel on multiple tasks and they might switch from task to task in an autonomous and self-organized way. So all in all, autonomy, self-organization, redundancy, locality, and parallel execution are properties that promote fault tolerance, scalability, and flexibility. Starting from the 90s, a reasonably large amount of research has been devoted to swarm robotics. The existing literature shows that self-organization is definitely a viable approach to coordinate the activity of a large group of robots. But at the same time, the literature does not report any reliable and general design methodology. So, so far, swarms are mostly designed by hand via trial and error, and this uh, uh, entails uh, high costs. The process uh, is uh, not predictable and is not repeatable, and uh, the swarms that are designed by hand do not come with any guarantee. It is our contention that the lack of an engineering methodology is what is currently preventing the real-world application of swarm robotics. Designing a robot swarm is particularly challenging because of the indirect nature of the design problem. Indeed, one has to design the individual to obtain some desired swarm level properties. The peculiarity of this design problem is that um, specifications are naturally expressed at the level of the swarm. Indeed, we want the swarm to do something. And typically, what we want the swarm to do is something that the individual robots are not able to perform on their own, individually. And they indeed need to cooperate to achieve their goals. But at the same time, a swarm is an immaterial concept. It's just a collection of robots. The swarm cannot be programmed directly. What you program is the individual robot. So you specify the swarm, but eventually you program the individual. And unfortunately, the interactions within a swarm are complex, and so far no general method has been proposed to tell 
what the individual robot should do so that a desired swarm level behavior is obtained. A rather classical approach to the automatic design of robot swarms is what is called evolutionary robotics, or more precisely in the context of swarm robotics, evolutionary swarm robotics. In this approach, each robot is controlled by a neural network that maps sensor readings to control actions and the parameters and possibly the structure of the neural network are obtained via artificial evolution. In this slide, you see the portrait of Charles Darwin, who, although has never studied robotics, as you might guess, is the father of the evolutionary theory to which evolutionary robotics is inspired. It is uh, our contention that if we look uh, at evolutionary robotics from an engineering perspective, it appears to have uh, a number of uh, shortcomings. In particular, in evolutionary robotics, the focus appears to be on research questions that are more relevant to biology rather than engineering. In particular, typical questions are whether some behavior that we observe in social insects can be the result of evolution, rather than questions of the kind uh, under what conditions uh, this design method produces the best results, for example. Clearly, there's uh, nothing wrong with uh, asking scientific questions that are relevant to biology. Uh, but from the point of view of the engineer, there are a number of relevant questions that have not been addressed yet. Second, the methodology that is applied in the evolutionary robotics literature is not always clear concerning the role that is played by the experimenter. The literature is often unclear on whether the design process is fully automatic or it has rather an iterative nature such that after every iteration the human designer looks at the results, modifies some elements of the design process, run the design process again, looks again at the result, and then iterates uh, these uh, steps over and over until some uh, satisfactory results are obtained. The literature describes uh, two families of uh, design methods what we call offline methods and what we call online methods. In offline design, there is a design phase that happens typically in simulation and before the robots are deployed in the target environment and therefore enter into an operation phase. In online design, on the other hand, the design process operates continuously while the robots are active in the target environment. In our research here at Iridia, we focus mostly on offline design, and this is indeed the topic of the rest of this lecture. This because we think that this is the core problem to be solved and we think that this problem is complex enough to be addressed at the beginning and online design is even more complex and so we feel it should be addressed only once the offline 
design problem is sufficiently well understood. Offline design can be further classified into one-shot methods and iterated methods. In a one-shot design process, we go through a number of different phases, including the specifications, the definition of the objective function that we wish to optimize, the core part of the design, which is an optimization process based on simulations, and eventually the control software is produced and deployed into the robot. On the other hand, in an iterated design process, the steps of specification, definition of the objective function that we wish to optimize, the core of the uh, optimization process, out of which we obtain some control software. This control software is assessed by a human expert, which might decide to uh, modify the objective function to penalize or to promote the emergence of specific features and properties in the control software. This process is iterated until when the human expert is happy with the control software produced or until it becomes impossible to further improve the control software. In our research and in the future of this presentation, we focus on the one-shot approach. This mostly because the iterated approach involves a human in the loop. Therefore, first of all, it cannot be fully considered as an automatic method, but rather we could call it a semi-automatic method. And the evaluation of an iterated process is particularly complex because the process is not easily reproducible as the quality of the control software that is eventually produced depend heavily on the abilities of the human expert. All in all, the offline design problem can be modeled as follows. A class of missions is given Let's go back again to the example of a Fiorella that we have seen at the beginning of this lecture. In that example, the class of missions is composed by all the missions that customers might request. So all the gardening missions that the robots of a Fiorella are able to accomplish. Out of this class of mission, one mission is assembled again to go back to the example of Fiorella, sampling one of the mission is what happens when a customer calls and asks for a specific service in their garden. By booking the service of Fiorella, they have extracted the sample, one of the missions out of the class of missions that Fiorella can accomplish with her robots. And the mission that is sample is indeed the one that corresponds to the specific garden and specific intervention they ask for. Once this mission is sampled, the design process is run in simulation. The control software is produced, is uploaded to the robots, and then the selected uh, the control software designed automatically is used in real-world operation. The whole process is iterated, which means that another mission is sampled and again another time the design process is run and another time the control software that is obtained is used for real-world operation. The iteration loop here is what gives a 
practical relevance to the automatic design process. Indeed, it is because of we wish to sample more and more missions out of the class of mission that it makes sense that we develop an automatic design method. An automatic design method makes fully sense once the effort that you put in developing the automatic design process is then compensated by the fact that you use this automatic tool over and over. It would not make sense to develop something that is fully automatic for then using it only a single time. There is a, an extremely important issue that uh, we have not discussed uh, so far, and it's uh, what is called uh, the reality gap. The reality gap is uh, simply the difference between uh, reality and uh, the simulation models that are used within the design process. The reality gap is... Uh, a, a huge problem in uh, the automatic uh, design of robot swarms. And this is uh, because uh, due to the reality gap, control software that is uh, developed uh, in uh, simulation does not uh, often work uh, as expected when it is uh, then installed on the robots. So after... Uh, introducing the notion of uh, reality gap, we can uh, move on to the main and most important uh, contribution that uh, we made, which is uh, our working hypothesis. Our working hypothesis is that uh, the reality gap that uh, we face in the automatic uh, design of uh, robot swarms uh, resembles uh, somehow the generalization problem that is studied in machine learning. It is well known that in machine learning we train a, an approximator on a training set, but then we have to use it on a test set. And what really matters is not the performance on the training set, but uh, the prediction capabilities that are observed on the test set. And the ability of moving from a training set, so moving from examples to the actual predictions that one has to do, is a generalization step. So our working hypothesis is that uh, crossing the reality gap is uh, somehow a sort of generalization step. So we want uh, the control software that uh, we develop in simulation to be able to generalize and uh, perform well also when it is installed on the real robots and then it has uh, to operate uh, in the real world. So out of this uh, working hypothesis, uh, the main idea behind uh, our proposal follows, and it is uh, to handle the reality gap using the same uh, approach and the same uh, tools that uh, are used in uh, machine learning to handle the generalization problem. Crossing the reality gap uh, successfully is one of uh, the main problems observed in uh, evolutionary robotics. Uh, now, equipped with uh, the notions that we have seen in the previous slide, we might attempt an explanation of this inability to cross the reality gap. The explanation could be that uh, the neural networks uh, that are uh, adopted in uh, evolutionary robotics and in general the whole evolutionary robotics uh, approach 
could be too powerful in terms of representational power. So it might have, uh, using the notions uh, of uh, uh, machine learning, a low bias, but also a very high variance. So this uh, might uh, determine a sort of uh, overfit of uh, the design process to the specific uh, properties of the simulation. And uh, due to this uh, overfitting to the specific properties uh, of the simulation, the control software that is uh, produced in simulation could be then unable to generalize uh, to reality. To address this issue, we have uh, uh, developed a new approach to the automatic design of uh, control software for robot swarms. We call this approach auto mode, which stands for automatic modular design. The idea behind uh, auto mode is uh, to limit the representational power of the control software produced by injecting bias. So we control robots using probabilistic finite state machines that are obtained by assembling and fine tuning pre-existing parametric modules. Each module is a low level behavior. This uh, Modules are uh, produced in a mission-independent way. So they are produced a priori uh, without uh, knowing in which uh, specific missions uh, they will be then used. And they are defined on the basis of the capabilities of the robots. And then we will see some examples later on. By restricting to the control software that can be produced by assembling predefined uh, modules, in a way we restrict the representational power of the design process. In other words, we reduce the space of uh, behaviors that we can realize. By doing so, we clearly inject a bias. So we will be possibly unable to produce a specific behavior that you might have in mind. But uh, by introducing a bias, we also reduce the variance. So we reduce the possibility that the system produces whatever behavior possible. If you continue with our comparison with neural networks, one might imagine that uh, the neural networks are so powerful that if we tweak the, the parameters of the neural network, we can indeed produce any behavior that come to our mind. And uh, this extreme flexibility is what uh, increases uh, the risk that uh, one then overfits the specific uh, properties and characteristics of the simulator. On the other hand, by introducing a bias and by reducing the space of possible behavior, uh, the idea is that we reduce the risk of overfitting. Automoda is uh, a general approach to design control software for robot swarms. Within this approach, we implemented uh, a number of uh, specific methods. The first one that we defined was called vanilla. Uh, vanilla because the idea was uh, to implement uh, a simple, straightforward and unsophisticated method that uh, uh, illustrates the uh, ideas of auto mode. So the idea was not to produce uh, the very best uh, design method uh, ever, but just uh, something uh, 
in which the ideas were clearly illustrated. So, in the following few slides, I will describe vanilla. So, first of all, I will describe the robot for which vanilla was conceived, and I will introduce a formal reference model for the robot. The robot is the EPAC, which is a small wheeled robot of a diameter of about 7 centimeters, and the EPAC has a number of sensors and actuators, and those that I describe in the reference model that we called RM1 are only the sensors and actuators that vanilla uses. Uh, so, the robot has uh, uh, eight infrared proximity sensors uh, which are positioned all around uh, its uh, body and might use uh, these uh, proximity sensors uh, to have uh, uh, information about the fact that it is approaching an obstacle or another robot. It has uh, eight uh, light sensors uh, which physically are the same proximity sensors that uh, um, are used by the robot to know whether in the environment uh, there is uh, a light source and to know in which direction the light source is. The robot also has uh, three ground sensors. They are placed under the robot and are able to tell whether the ground is white, gray, or black. And the robot has also a sensor that is called the range and bearing. And it's a sensor that allows the robot to know whether in the neighborhood there are other peer robots. If another robot is in the neighborhood, which means uh, at a distance of less than uh, about 70 centimeters, the EPAC can uh, perceive the presence of uh, this robot and know roughly the angle and the distance of this robot. And then the EPAC has uh, two wheels and uh, it uh, can set the speed of uh, this uh, two wheels to move forward, backward, or uh, in circles. The control cycle of the robot has a period of 100 milliseconds, which means that every 100 milliseconds the sensors are uh, updated, and every 100 milliseconds it is allowed to change the speed of the wheels. Vanilla generates a control software in the form of a probabilistic finite state machines and it does so by assembling and fine-tuning predefined modules that are either low-level behaviors or conditions for transitioning from one behavior to another one. Uh, the behaviors uh, available to vanilla are six, and they are exploration, in which uh, a robot uh, moves uh, randomly in uh, the environment, stop, in which the robot uh, stays uh, still, phototaxis, in which the robot uh, goes uh, in the direction of uh, a light, uh, if a light is perceived, or it moves uh, randomly, Anti-phototaxis, in which the robot moves away from the light if a light is perceived, otherwise it moves randomly. Attraction, in which the robot goes towards its neighboring peers if any is perceived, otherwise it moves randomly. And repulsion, in which the robot goes away from the neighboring peers if any is perceived, otherwise it moves randomly. 
the conditions are six, black floor, so change uh, current behavior if uh, the floor is black, gray floor, change behavior if uh, the floor is gray, white floor, change behavior if uh, the floor is white, neighbor count, uh, change behavior if uh, the number of neighbor is at least uh, the value of a parameter, invert the neighbor count, uh, the robot changes behavior if uh, the number of neighbors perceived is less than the value of a parameter, and fixed probability in which the robot changes behavior with a given fixed probability. Here in this slide, you see also an example of a finite state machine that Vanilla assembled for solving the aggregation problem. The aggregation problem is a problem which the robot have to aggregate on a black spot on the ground. We will see more about this in the next slides. So to solve this problem, Vanilla automatically generated a finite state machine in which the robot start in the attraction behavior. If the floor is black, they stop. And uh, while the robot is in the stop behavior, it might uh, go back to the attraction behavior through two different uh, paths. One is uh, if the floor becomes gray, which means that uh, the robot has been pushed outside uh, the black area by another robot, or just uh, with a fixed probability. So uh, with a fixed probability, the robot might uh, decide to leave uh, the uh, black region and go back uh, to the attraction behavior. To explore uh, the space of uh, the possible finite state machines uh, that can be obtained by assembling the modules we have seen in the previous slides, Vanilla uses an optimization algorithm that maximizes a performance measure that is mission dependent and indeed represents a sort of formal specification of the mission. So it formally defines what the robot should do. The optimization algorithm used by Vanilla is uh, uh, an algorithm called F-Race that we had previously introduced to uh, fine-tune the parameters of uh, heuristic optimization methods. In F-Race, a number of candidate design are initially sampled randomly and then they are evaluated iteratively on a number of uh, cases. So each case is a different initial position of the robots in the environment, for example. So using simulation, the different candidate design, which are finite state machines that are initially sampled, are evaluated and uh, after each iteration, so after testing all the possible candidate designs that have been initially sampled, some of these candidate designs are dropped from the race. And they are dropped because they are dominated in a statistically significant way by at least another candidate design. The whole process continues and stops when a single candidate design survives or when a initially defined number of evaluations that we call the design budget has been used. When the algorithm stops, the best configuration found 
up to that moment is returned as the finite state machine selected by vanilla. I will present now some experiments in which um, we studied automode vanilla. So the design of the behavior for a robot swarm is uh, performed in simulation using Argos and uh, we test uh, the control software produced with a swarm of 20 EPAC robots. We design a control software for uh, two missions. One is uh, aggregation that we have uh, briefly already introduced before, and the other one is uh, a simplified version of uh, foraging. I will tell you some more about this uh, in the next slide, we consider three budget levels, which means that we run the design process with three different maximal number of simulation runs allowed. And these three levels are 10,000 runs, 50,000 runs, and 200,000 runs. We compare two design methods, one is vanilla and the other one is EvoStick, which is an implementation of the classical evolutionary robotics approach. In these experiments, no modification whatsoever is allowed to adapt the two design methods to the two missions that we consider or to the budget level. So the two design methods are defined in all their details once and for all and they are used as they are out of the box on the different missions and for the different budget levels. Here I give you some more details about the two missions. So one is aggregation. In aggregation, there are two black areas and the robots must select one of these two black areas and aggregate there. The objective function that formally defines what we want to obtain is the maximum between NA and NB divided by N. N is the total number of robots. In our experiments, it is 20. And NA and NB are the number of robots that at the end of an experimental run are on area A, or on area B. I give you an example. If uh, we have uh, at the end of the run 10 robots on uh, one of the two areas and five robots on the other and the other five going around on the gray area, the final score will be 10, the maximum between 10 and 5, divided by... 20, which is the total number of robots. So the final score will be 0.5. Foraging is a, a classical uh, uh, mission considered in uh, swarm robotics. The robots uh, are uh, supposed to move in the environment and gather objects and bring them back to the nest. The nest here is represented by the white area. The EPAC robot are unable to manipulate objects, so they would be unfit to perform a real foraging mission. So we consider an abstract, idealized version of foraging. The two black spots that you see are considered as sources of items that the robots should retrieve. 
And we consider that an item is uh, retrieved by an IPAC robot when the robot steps on one of the two black areas and then walks back to the white area that represents the nest. So when the robot goes back and forth from one area to the nest, we increase the objective function by one unit, which uh, represents the fact that the robot has retrieved an item uh, and uh, has uh, taken it back to the nest. In this experiment, right behind uh, the white area, so in the bottom of uh, the picture, there is a light source. You see the shadow projected by the robots. And uh, the robots can use uh, this uh, light source to navigate back to the nest. Here we have uh, the results for the mission aggregation. The three uh, box plots that you see concern uh, design budget 10K, 50K and uh, 200K. You see in uh, uh, white uh, the results uh, for uh, vanilla and in grey the one for Evo stick. The thin boxes are the results obtained in simulation and the wide boxes are those uh, obtained on the rear robots. In this mission, the uh, objective function is uh, to be maximized, so the higher the better in this plot. What you see is that um, the performance in simulation of EvoStick is quite good and it's slightly increasing with the design budget. But then on the rear robots, we have a, a quite a noticeable drop in performance. On the other hand, the results are vanilla remain similar in simulation and in reality. And all in all, the box plot, of the results obtained by Vanilla on the rear robots, is always above the one of Evo Stick, which shows that Vanilla obtains better results. Out of this first experiment, we can see that Evo Stick indeed suffers uh, of uh, a noticeable drop uh, in performance when moving to reality and uh, uh, vanilla does not. Here we have uh, the results on the foraging mission and uh, the situation here is uh, even more explicit. We notice that uh, the performance of EvoStick in simulation is always better than the one of Vanilla. The narrow boxes for EvoStick are always higher than those of Vanilla. And we see that when the design budget increases, the performance of EvoStick increases a lot. But when we move to the rear robots. While the performance of vanilla remains more or less the same, the one of EvoStick drops significantly. So EvoStick is excellent in simulation, but then when we move to the rear robot, the performance is much worse than the one of Vanilla. I have uh, prepared a video.
Having seen these results, we can make our first conclusions. So, the modules of vanilla have proved to be general enough to produce a control software for two different missions. Now, whether these modules are general enough to produce a control software for any possible mission that can be performed by robots that are described by the reference model RM1 is an empirical question and we are unable to answer it on the basis of the information we have and on the basis of our theoretical understanding. The only way to have an answer to this question is to apply vanilla to a set of missions and see whether it is successful or not. In the following slides, we will start going into this direction. I will present now an experiment that involves five human designers. These five human designers were PhD students at Iridia in Swarm Robotics. They were proficient in Argos and acquainted with the EPAC robots. But they were unaware of Automode Vanilla and of its functioning. They had three different duties. First of all, they were asked to conceive a mission. So each of these five human designers was asked to conceive a mission that they thought could be accomplished by a swarm of 20 EPAC robots described by the reference model RM1 and operating into uh, an arena that uh, has uh, the same characteristics of the one that we have seen for the previous experiments, but in which they could have added uh, obstacles, multiple patches, for instance, position the light source or not, and so on. So they were given a set of constraints on how to conceive a mission. And uh, within uh, these uh, constraints, uh, they had uh, complete freedom to uh, define a mission that uh, the robots uh, had uh, to perform. Then uh, they were asked uh, to solve another mission, so a mission proposed by another one of the five uh, human designers. And they were asked to do so by assembling the modules of vanilla. And as a, a third duty, they were asked to solve another mission, so one proposed by another one of the uh, human designer. And they were supposed to do so by programming directly in C++, which is something that they are able to do very well for the EPAC robots. Also for this uh, second set of experiments, the design is uh, always uh, performed in simulation using Argos. And then we test the control software produced on 20 EPAC robots. The design budget for the automatic design methods is 200 Ks simulation runs which takes about two hours and a half on our uh, computer cluster. Humans, on the other hand, are uh, allowed to work for four hours to produce each of the instances of control software that they are supposed to produce. So as we have five human experts and each of them propose a mission, eventually we have five missions. We will see some details of the missions 
later on. All in all, we study four design methods. One is vanilla, the other one is evostick, and then we have C-human and U-human. C-human are the humans when they are constrained to use the modules of vanilla in the design process. And U-human are the humans that are unconstrained, so they program directly the robots in C++. What is important to notice is that for the two automatic design methods involved in this study, vanilla and Evostick, no modification whatsoever is allowed to adapt these methods to the new missions. So these uh, uh, two design methods are exactly the same that we used in the previous experiments. Here we move uh, to the results and we start uh, uh, observing the results uh, mission per mission. So in the first mission, the robots have uh, to enter a shelter which is represented by the white area and uh, uh, they can enter the shelter only from one side. You see that the shelter is surrounded on three sides out of four by wooden blocks. Here, the results are represented with a box plot. The, again, the wide boxes are the results observed in on the rear robots and the narrow boxes are those uh, obtained in a simulation. So you see that uh, uh, EvoStick has a fantastic performance in a simulation but then uh, it drops in reality and uh, you see that the performance of vanilla in simulation and reality is more or less the same you also see that uh, the humans, uh, when they are unconstrained, they suffer from the reality gap. So, and, uh, and they suffer from the reality gap much less uh, when they are constrained to use uh, the modules of vanilla. Um, which suggests, again, that uh, the general idea of injecting bias and uh, reducing the freedom of uh, the design method helps in crossing the uh, reality gap successfully. We move now to a video in which you will see the performance of the control software produced by the two automatic design method and by the human designers, constrained and unconstrained. In this mission, the robots have to cover the largest surface of the arena possible while remaining connected. So they need to remain at a maximum distance one from the other and at the same time spread in the arena. Uh, here the results show that um, um, vanilla Evo stick and the U human have uh, quite a noticeable uh, drop uh, in uh, performance. So they perform quite well in simulation, but the results uh, in, uh, uh, on the robots are lower. But it has also to be noticed that uh, these differences are significant, but are quite uh, tiny. And uh, in practice, uh, uh, all the methods uh, perform uh, more or less uh, the same. Also, in this uh, mission, the robots are supposed to cover the arena, but there are regions in which they are uh, 
supposed not to enter and these regions are represented by the black patch. Uh, also, um, in this case, the results uh, obtained by the different uh, methods uh, are quite uh, similar. Uh, in this mission, the objective function is uh, to be minimized. So you see that uh, also in this case, uh, the performance in simulation is better than the one obtained by the robots, but the performance of uh, the different uh, methods is uh, quite uh, close. Here the robots have to cover the surface of the white square and the perimeter of the black circle. The performance of vanilla U-human and C-human is similar. On the other hand, the performance of EvoStick is very poor on the robots. Also in this case, uh, the objective function is uh, to be minimized. In this uh, last mission, the robot must uh, aggregate on the black spot and uh, there is uh, a light source in the environment that uh, they can use as an ambient cue. Uh, here, um, again, uh, EvoStick uh, suffers from uh, uh, a large uh, uh, drop in performance and also unconstrained uh, humans. So, uh, vanilla and sea human which are uh, uh, constrained to use uh, the given module manage to transfer better from simulation to reality. The following slide is a video that I have prepared for you. It is hard to make conclusions out of the results that we have seen so far mission per mission. It's much more interesting to aggregate them across the missions and observe whether there is any general trend. So in this plot, you see the average rank obtained by the uh, different uh, design uh, methods across the different missions. You see that uh, the best performance is obtained by constrained uh, humans. Then uh, vanilla follows, and uh, then EvoStick and U-Human. So the first thing we can observe is that these results confirm what we had seen already in the previous experiments, that is that vanilla performs better than EvoStick. Then the good results of C-Human um, show that the modules of vanilla are sufficiently general to accomplish the given missions. As a C-human and vanilla are based on the same set of modules and they differ only in the way they are combined so they are combined by a human being in C human and are combined by an optimization algorithm in vanilla we can conclude that uh, the weak part of vanilla is the optimization algorithm 
and that possibly by adopting a better optimization algorithm, we could match the performance of C human. Another observation that we can make it concerns the comparison between C human and U human. The fact that the human programmer obtain better results by being constrained to use the modules of vanilla confirm the original idea that by injecting bias we obtain a method that is more robust to the uh, reality gap. So we see that also the human beings are subject to overfitting and they suffer from the reality gap. And these results indicate that putting constraints to the human being helps in crossing the reality gap. As the results of our previous experiments indicate that the weak part of vanilla is the optimization algorithm, it makes sense to develop a new uh, design method that uh, is based on vanilla but uh, that adopts uh, a better optimization algorithm. So we introduced uh, chocolate. In uh, chocolate, the optimization algorithm is uh, iterated a phrase which is an advanced version of the F-Race algorithm that was adopted in vanilla. Apart from adopting a different optimization algorithm, chocolate is exactly identical to vanilla. Iterated F-Race, as the name suggests, consists in iterating the F-Race algorithm multiple times. It works like that. We sample an initial set of candidate design, as we do in F-Race. We run F-Race. We take the winners of the race and we sample around them to obtain a new set of initial candidate design. On this new set of candidate design, we run again a phrase and we iterate until the budget depletes. To assess chocolate, we run a set of experiments on the same missions that we have considered in the previous experiments. And we compare the results of chocolate with those of vanilla and of sea human, which was the best um, method that um, we studied in the previous experiments. We go quickly through the results of the different missions. So in the mission in which the robot have to enter the shelter, we see that chocolate clearly improves with respect to vanilla. For this mission, I have prepared a video. Also, in the largest covering network, chocolate obtains better results than vanilla and more or less the same results of sea human. Here in coverage with forbidden areas, the results of the three methods are very close. Surface and perimeter coverage, also in this case, the results are very close with the chocolate that is slightly better than vanilla. 
aggregation with ambient cues, also in this case chocolate is better than vanilla and better than sea human. Also for this mission I have prepared a video. Here we have the aggregate results of these experiments and we clearly see that chocolate improves over vanilla and performs better than sea human. Chocolate is the first method for the automatic design of robot swarms that has been shown to produce better results than human designers in an experiment performed under controlled conditions. With this slide we conclude the class. We have discussed the automatic design of robot swarms in the light of concepts of machine learning we have introduced um, auto mode, which is uh, a promising approach to perform the automatic design of robot swarms. We have seen uh, two methods, vanilla and chocolate, and we have seen that chocolate was able to produce better results than human designers. We have also seen some innovative element in the way in which empirical studies are conceived. Besides vanilla and chocolate, we have defined a number of other methods that comply with the definition of auto mode. So we will go very quickly through them. We have defined Janduya, which is a method in which the communication between robots is automatically designed by the design method. Waffle, in which we design the hardware and the software together. We have defined Maple, in which the uh, architecture, the software architecture, is not a finite state machine but a behavior tree. We have defined MATE, in which uh, the robots uh, have uh, some uh, low level behavior to spatially organize, so to position themselves uh, one with uh, respect to the others to form a lattice. Tutti Frutti, in which the robot uh, can display colors and see the color displayed by other robots and use these colors to communicate. Coconut, in which the exploration strategy used by the robot can be fine-tuned by the design um, method. And Isopop, in which the optimization is performed using simulated annealing. We move on to the following slide, number 45. There are other uh, directions uh, in uh, the automatic design of uh, robot swarms uh, that we are uh, currently exploring. In particular, understanding the true nature of the reality gap and finding ways uh, to handle it uh, effectively. The formal specification of missions, so ways to formally describe a mission to be performed by robots. We're exploring alternative optimization algorithms, alternative software architectures, and we are trying to scale up in complexity in the sense that we are trying to, we are trying to port what we have done to robots uh, that are uh, more complex and have uh, uh, more advanced uh, hardware capabilities. We are trying to enrich uh, 
the set of low level behaviors and the conditions that are manipulated by the automatic design methods and we are trying to find more complex missions on which we can test our automatic design methods. The research that I have presented during this class has been performed mostly in the framework of the project The Murge, which is funded by the European Research Council with an ERC consolidator grant. The main idea of the, the, the Murge project is to define a method for the automatic design of robot swarms. The Demurge will be an intelligent system that is able to design robot swarms in an integrated and automatic way, starting from some requirements that are expressed in a high-level specification language. The Demurge will design automatically the hardware and the control software. And the Demurge does not create a, a design from scratch, but it will operate on pre-existing software and hardware modules and will assemble them automatically in the spirit that we have seen during this class. The name Demurge comes from a figure described by Plato, and the Demurge is um, a deity in uh, Plato's uh, philosophy, a deity that fashions the sensible world, taking inspiration from the world of forms. And uh, he does so by assembling pre-existing matter. So it's a deity that does not create the universe from scratch, but fashion the world as we see it. Right, we move uh, to the very last slide in which uh, I wanted to list uh, the names uh, of uh, the people um, who contributed to producing the results uh, that I have presented um, in uh, this uh, class. The people that uh, you see um, surrounded by a red frame are uh, people um, who uh, did their uh, master thesis uh, with me. Some of them then uh, continued uh, as uh, PhD students. The message is uh, that uh, every year I typically supervise uh, two or three master thesis. So if you are interested in um, swarm robotics and if you are interested in the automatic design of uh, robot swarms, please uh, let me know and I will uh, be very happy to discuss uh, with you about uh, a possible research. Thank you very much for your attention.